So, just how are those preseason ratings generated for college football? Well, I'll show you how I do it. Welcome to Sports Betting Truth, where it is my goal to give you actual sports betting advice without the touting, shilling, hype, or false promises. Now, today is all about college football. We're just a few weeks away. Um, it's August 7th, so we are 17 days away from college football. It is my favorite time of the year. August for me is like December for other people. It's like Christmas for me. I love it. I cannot wait for college football to get started. I got some of my college football memorabilia out here to celebrate, and it's just a great time of the year. I got my ninth annual trip to Las Vegas coming up. Every year I go to Las Vegas for the first week of college football. It's like a tradition for me. And it's going to be ultra fun this year because this is going to be the first year where sports betting truth is going to be there as well. So stay tuned. I got a lot of college football and Las Vegas oriented videos coming in just a couple of weeks. In the meantime, let's get started on today's topic and that is preseason ratings. So I'm sure you've seen these a lot, especially for college sports is that a lot of people will generate preseason ratings for the upcoming season before any games are played. And I'm sure you're wondering, how are these ratings generated when no games have been played? That's a great question. They use a lot of principles I've already talked about on my YouTube channel so far, and some new ones that I'll show you. But in general, it's just math. There's a lot of people who do this. S&P does it, FEI does it, Jeff Sagarin does it, ESPN's FPI does it. Everyone who has good power rating systems has some kind of good formula that they use to generate their preseason ratings. And as every week of the season goes on, the preseason ratings have less and less influence. And when enough games have been played to build up a big enough sample size, then they can be dropped altogether. But in the meantime, early on in the season, when there's not enough sample size of games that have, that have been played to generate accurate ratings based on this season, you have to use the past to predict the future. And that's where this comes into play. So I'll show you how I do it, the approach I use. So this Excel document I have is called the CFB Stat Database. I have a lot of stats contained in here, but the three tabs that are relevant to today's video are open right now. So this tab right here is the returning production tab. I have 11 different stats right here that I'm gonna highlight in gray that I use to help make predictions for the upcoming season. They are the returning production stats. In other words, all these stats represents the percentage of that stat that is returning from the year before. So for example, in 2018, Air Force returned 60% of their interceptions from the year before. They returned 39.9% of their overall tackles and 63.5% of their rush yards. They also only returned 13 starts on the offensive line, which is very low, but they returned 100% of their punting yards. So you use these returning production numbers to help you make some good projections for the upcoming season, because theoretically, if someone returns less of something, then they're going to regress. And if they return more of something, then they're going to improve. So today I'm going to use three different examples of how this can work in theory. I have three different stats in here that I'm going to color in green. Now the rush stat is offensive rushing. It's Bill Connolly's S&P rushing offense stat. I'm using opponent adjusted stats for this example just because this really only works when you're using opponent adjusted stats. And I'll explain why later. I'm also using Bill Connolly's defensive pass S&P. And lastly, I'm using the SRS rating from sportsreference.com. These are three different stats that I'm going to show how you can measure upcoming ratings for the season. The Kerr column represents a 2018 stat, the PST column represents a 2017 stat, and the Diff column represents the difference between the two, how much it changed year over year. So this tab is what I call the four-year tab. It's just the past four years of stats, as well as another column called talent. Now this is a 24-7 talent composite. In other words, it's their overall four-year average of recruiting rankings that they come out with every year. Hypothetically, the higher the talent, the higher your stat's going to be. So the reason I use the past four years is because that's a full recruiting cycle. Four years is generally the generation in college football, so to speak. Everything can be measured over four-year intervals. But if you want to use more, there's nothing wrong with that at all. But four is usually the good number you want to shoot for when you're doing stuff like this. So now I'm going to calculate the 2019 preseason ratings for these three teams and the stats we picked. And here's why I picked these three teams. For Oregon, I picked them because they returned more production than any other team in the country. It's ridiculous what they returned. And they would have returned even more if Dylan Mitchell stayed for his senior year. It's ridiculous how much they returned. So no doubt they should improve in 2019. Purdue is on the other end of the spectrum. They lost more production than any other P5 team in the country. And it's going to be interesting to see if their improved recruiting under Jeff Brom can help balance that out. 
And lastly, I picked TCU just because they're the school I played for and the team I root for, so I just want to see how they're going to change. But overall, these first two teams represent the two ends of the spectrum of returning a lot and returning a little. Okay, so the first thing I do is I calculate what I call the baseline. Now, the baseline is pretty self-explanatory. It's a baseline of what can be expected from the program. It's just a weighted four-year average. For example, Alabama. They're probably going to keep being good for the foreseeable future. If you're going to project Alabama's next season, it's probably going to be close to what they've done the past few seasons. Every program has a baseline, and while new coaching hires or better recruiting can change things, for the most part, a program isn't going to stray very far from its baseline. So to calculate the baseline, I go to this four-year tab, and I make a pivot table. And then I put the year in the columns, I put the team over here, and then I can use my values as a filter. So I had the past four years of values here, so to do a weighted average, it's simply just making the most recent years be weighted more than the most distant years in this average. And it's not that hard. I want to make 2018 worth twice as much as 2015. So to do that, it's pretty easy. It's B5, which is 2015 times 1 plus, plus C5 times 1.33 plus D5 times 1.67 plus E5 times 2 slash, slash 6. And that's Air Force's four-year weighted average based on the concept of 2018 being weighted twice as more as 2015. So we find the teams are looking for, so Oregon's one, I can put that right here. So those are the baselines of those three programs in terms of rushing. And now the same thing for the other two stats. These are the weighted four-year SRSs, and we put them right here. All right, so we got our baselines. All right, so we have the baselines in place. Purdue is a good example to use here because they've really improved under Jeff Brom in their first two years, but they still had those other two years before him weighing them down. So that might be an example of when a baseline might be as accurate, but a program like TCU that's been very consistent with the same head coach for 20 years, it's going to be a bit more predictive. Okay, so the next thing we can do is what we call the regression. So for the regression, we want to come over here and calculate regressions based on returning production. So the y variable in our regression here is going to be the differential. How did things change based on returning production? So we're going to do a regression based on the rushing and see which variables matter when it comes to projecting how rushing offense changes. So scroll down to regression. So the y variable is going to be rushing differential. Scroll down. And then the x variables are going to be all the offensive stats, which are these four. And we're going to see which of these stats influence a change and then we'll do some line fit plots okay so ol starts obviously has an upward slope so that's predictive so does this so does that but pass yards is kind of flat so looking at the p values pass yards is the one that's over 0.05 which means we can probably throw it out so receiving yards returning rush yards returning and offensive line starts are your three variables that are going to predict how rushing offense is going to change you think that with passing yards, it might be an influence because a good quarterback means the defense can't cheat towards a run, but it doesn't look like in this example that it is that much of an influence. So knowing that, we can throw pass yards out of our equation here and recalculate the regression without it. All right, so this is the equation we can use right here for our regression. So Oregon is returning 53.8 of its receiving yards, 85.5% of its rush yards, and 153 offensive line starts, which is a lot. So to calculate that, you do the formula right here, which equals intercept, which is U6 or U7, plus the coefficients for the other three. So receiving yards, U8, U8 times returning receiving production of I2, plus U9 times returning rush production of J2, plus U10 times offensive line starts, M2. Okay, and there we go. We can expect Oregon's rush S&P to improve by about 6.59, which is in line with all the production they're returning. Now let's do the same for Purdue. Okay, so we can expect Purdue's rush S&P to decline by about 3.16 based on what they return, which makes sense because they only return 16.6 rush yards and only 51 offensive line starts. And then for TCU... We expect them to improve by about 2.44, which makes sense. They return a lot of rush yards, a lot of receiving yards, in the middle of the road of offensive line starts. So there will be improvement, but not as much as Oregon's. And then we're going to do the same for the other two stats. So our y-axis is going to be defensive pass differential, and then our x-axis is going to be these five defensive stats right here. And here we go. 
Looks like returning tackles has a lot to do with it. Returning tackles for loss. Not so much returning sacks, pass deflections, and interceptions. So looking at the p-values, it's really just how much tackles are returning that are the most predictive variables here for pass defense, which is surprising. You'd think it would be interceptions and pass deflections, but it's really not. So, it's, so overall, it looks like pass defense is about overall cohesion of how much overall the defensive returns instead of just the secondary or just the defensive line. It's about the overall unit, which makes sense because defense works best when it plays as a team, and it's easier to be on the same page when you're experienced and return a lot from the year before. So knowing what we know, we can use all these to project our pass defense. You could just run with the tackles and then intercept, but, but let's go ahead and run with the whole thing just to do it. Because it's not as clear cut as the rush offense was, you do run the risk of overfitting, but I don't think it's gonna be an issue in this case. So for Oregon, it's going to be the intercept U12 plus interceptions, which is C2 times U13 plus pass deflections, which is C3 times U14 plus pass breakups, which is D2 times U14 plus sacks, which is E2 times U15 plus TFL, which is F2 times U16 plus tackles, which is our most predictive variable, which is G2 plus U17. All right, so we can expect Oregon's past defense S&P to improve by 7.58. Again, they return quite a lot. Not as much as offense, but they return enough. And then Purdue, on the other hand, so Purdue actually returns more than Oregon on the defensive side of the ball, so it's no surprise that their defense is expected to improve by more. Now TCU, they lose quite a lot. Although we're expecting our defense to be pretty good in 2019, there is some production that has to be replaced, but the head coach is a defensive genius, so we'll see if he can right the ship anyway. This is going to be interesting. All right, so TCU is expected to improve by 7.4, which is surprising, but they do return a lot in the secondary, and the interception stat is a positive predictor. So I'm surprised that they're expected to improve based on what they return, but hey, the model is the model, right? And now lastly, let's do SRS. So we're going to use everything for SRS, all the returning stats here. So our Y variable is going to be SRS diff, and our X variable is going to be everything. So we're going to see what stats matter when it comes to overall change. All right, so looking at the p-values here, looks like returning sacks is a predictor, returning pass yards, returning receiving yards, returning rush yards, returning punt yards, surprisingly. Those are your main predictors here. So what this is saying is that a good defensive line that returns and an overall good skill positions on offense that's returning and a good punter that's returning is what makes a good returning team. All right, so knowing those five variables, we can create our SRS change predictor. All right, so the Y will stay the same and then we're gonna use these five variables. Okay, so here's our equation. So for SRS change, it's going to be intercept, which is U19, plus sacks, which is E2, times the sack coefficient, which is U20, plus pass yards, which is H2, times the pass coefficient, U21, plus receiving yards, which is I2, times U22, plus rush yards, J2, times U23, plus punt, plus punt yards, which is L2, times u24 and we can expect oregon's srs to improve by 1.22 which is a lot so purdue looks like they're going to decline by about 2.65 and then tcu is going to decline by about 1.34 based on that so that's our regression based on returning production and then our last regression is going to be talent based so for this one we're going to use talent as our x variable and the actual stat itself and not the change for the y variable the idea being that the higher the talent score the higher the stat so let's start with the rush it's going to be a one variable regression our x range is going to be d and then our x range over here is going to be talent line fit plots there we go. It barely slopes upwards, but it does slope upwards, so we can use it. This is for rushing offense. So there's our intercept and coefficient. There we go. So we can expect based on talent, this is going to be the stat based on the talent rating alone. 104 for Oregon, 101 for Purdue, 103 for TCU. And then we can do the same thing for defensive pass. So the only thing that's going to change is our Y range. The X is going to stay the same. And that line slopes upwards a lot more than the rush one did. So this one looks better. Equals intercept of Y7 plus coefficient Y8 
times talent rating, which is N2. And there we go for Oregon and Purdue and TCU based on the talent number. And then lastly, SRS. How does SRS change based on 24 sevenths talent? Now that is what you call a slope. That is a slope. So SRS is very predicted by the 24 seven talent predictor times N2 talent. So we can expect Oregon, Purdue, and TCU. So we have our three numbers. So now we can project our rating. So really how much weight you wanna to give to all three of these approaches is really up to you. So I'm gonna give the baseline 40%, I'm gonna give the regression 40%, and I'm gonna give the talent 20%. How does that sound? I'm gonna make three columns right here of the rush regression change, D pass regression change, and SRS regression change, which is just their 2018 number plus these numbers right here. So for the rushing projection, it's going to be the baseline, which I'm giving 40%, R2 times 0.4, plus the regression, which I'm giving 40%, which is X2 times 0.4, plus the talent, which I'm gonna give 20%, AA2 times 0.2. And there's our number. We can expect Oregon's rushing S&P to be 105.79 based on this model. Last year is 99.5, so we're expecting them to improve quite a bit, which makes sense based on what they return, their talent level, and their baseline. For Purdue, we are expecting 101.3, which they were at 106 last year, and they, they lose a lot. Don't forget, they lose a lot, so it makes a lot of sense that they're going to take a step back. So we'll have to see if Jeff Brom's recruiting will make up for that or if they're gonna struggle. Now for TCU, they return a lot in receiving and rushing, which is a predictor. We're expecting 101.84. Last year, they're at 96.3, so it's gonna be improvement. All right, now let's do the same thing for passing. Oregon is expected to go from 99.6 to 104, an improvement. Purdue is expected to go from 95 to 100. That's an improvement, and that's where Purdue's improvement is gonna be this year. They return a lot on defense, so their defense is gonna to have to carry them to make up for the offensive inexperience early on. But if their defense can improve with numbers like that, then their offense won't need to have as much of a burden. It's going to be interesting. And then TCU, known for having a great defense year in and year out, is expected to be high at 113, which is about a little bit less than last year. So they're still going to be good, but the jury's still out. And lastly, the SRS projection. How is the team going to change overall in 2019 based on this method? Okay, so we expect Oregon's SRS to be 7.5. Purdue's 3.3 and TCU 5.58. So TCU looks to improve, Purdue looks to take a step back, and Oregon looks to improve just barely, but there is improvement in store for them, which is kind of a disappointment because the SRS regression is kind of working against them. But overall, that's how you use regression and baselines to generate preseason ratings before the games are even played. So now you kind of know what goes into that, so you're not as confused when you see these preseason ratings and wondering how they came up with them. Now you can use this for any stat you want to. These are just three examples I use, but any stat you want to, you can use this method for as long as you're willing to put into work to collect all the data. I do suggest you use opponent adjusted stats for this because it's one thing to have five yards of carry against a Conference USA schedule and another thing to have five yards of carry against an SEC schedule. This is meant to be predictive and it's hard to be predictive when you're not adjusting for strength of schedule. But overall that wraps up today's lesson on preseason ratings. Again, I'll be in Las Vegas for opening week of college football. A lot's going to be going on so stay tuned for that as well as stay tuned to this YouTube channel. I have more between now and then that I'll be giving to you. Until next time, this is Sports Betting Truth signing off.